So I'm a neurologist since 1996. I'm a consultant neurologist right now. Also the chairman of the Department of Neuroscience, which here at Mother Day Hospital comprises neurology and neurosurgery. So um, why neurology? It's been a long time, but I think what intrigued me most was the clinical exam and sort of way, the logical approach to um, finding out where the problem is in what we call the neuro axis, that means the brain spinal cord and peripheral nerves. So it's sort of puzzling it out. Parkinson disease is largely a clinical diagnosis, so there are certain clinical criteria that we look out for in order to render a diagnosis. Sometimes we do get it wrong, so, so sometimes we falsely say that someone has Parkinson's and then transpires eventually that he doesn't, and vice versa. But this is known, even movement disorder specialists get it wrong. <laughs> okay, so it's important that there is a percentage of error here. Um, but it's largely a clinical diagnosis, um, um, but you have to be prepared to eat humble pie and revise it <laughs> if it needs to, to be revised. Um, it's important um, because it's more likely to, um, uh, to get a proper diagnosis in the hands of a neurologist. Um, obviously, um, general practitioners help a lot because they do narrow down the people that they see and uh, then they send them to us and um, we assess them and if necessary reassess them after a few months to see how they're responding to treatment or not and that will give you an indication whether they have true Parkinson's disease um, or not. Um, it's also important not only at the initial stage for diagnosis but also in follow-up because you need to see how the patient is responding to treatment and whether they need to be referred for um, ancillary stuff like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology and uh, encourage them to um, not only take their medications but also to live an active life and exercise. I would think we hardly have anything that is lacking here. We have most of the drugs that are available elsewhere, at least in the, in the Western world. Um, uh, and also have the availability of deep brain stimulation, which is the surgical procedure that is carried out in uh, some patients with Parkinson's, especially under the age of 70 years. So that's available too. We have Mr. Ludwig Zrinzer, who, um, uh, who's a neurology, neurosurgery, sorry, professor who comes down from Queen Square in London to operate on these patients um, uh, um, every, every, every year. Um, uh, so, um, and we also have um, a group of physical therapists at St. Luke's Hospital who have a special interest in Parkinson's disease um, and they do follow them up closely. Yeah, well, pesticide, there, there are certain things that, that are known to predispose someone for, to develop Parkinson's disease. And um, pesticides is one of them, drinking well water is another. On the other hand, uh, people who smoke are less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. It's probably one of the few <laughs> benefits of cigarette smoking, I would guess. Um, but these are environmental factors that are closely or loosely connected to, to this diagnosis. Um, obviously, as regards things that one avoids, like pesticides, sometimes it's hard to avoid, especially in a small country like ours. Um, but there, there, there are environmental factors. I mean, there's definitely a genetic predisposition for one to develop Parkinson's disease, especially the early onset ones. Um, but I'm sure that there are environmental triggers that sort of um, precipitate and predispose for one developing the clinical features of Parkinson's disease. Um, um, as regards diet, the only thing that can sort of cause problems is protein in the diet. However, it's rare that we put patients on a protein-restricted diet except in really advanced Parkinson's disease. Okay, so as regards diet, normally we we'll leave them free to, 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 to eat whatever they like. Because the reason is because of the interaction, because protein breaks down into amino acids. Okay. So those, those amino acids contain, um, one of the amino acids is tryptophan, mm -hmm. and tryptophan and uh, levodopa have the same carrier that takes them in. 
So if you flood the system with a protein meal, so you've got increased tryptophan, you take the medication after meals, you should take it before meals, but if you take it after meals, then the levodopa is not absorbed. Okay. So that's the reason. So it is important that patients with, and people with Parkinson's lead an active life, um, physically active, and that is why it's important that they exercise. And I think Step Up for Parkinson's was endorsed by me because it's an opportunity in a very friendly environment, um, um, surrounded by other people with Parkinson's and their carers, to carry out physical activity with a twist. It's a, it's a bit different than the usual walk down the road or <laughs> going to the beach. Um, it's just something different. And uh, I think it's beneficial and the people who have come back to me, who have gone, um, are very happy with it. So the most important thing that I would tell people with Parkinson's is remain active physically and mentally. Okay, so you need to do at least half an hour of physical activity. So not work. So some people with Parkinson's still work, which is fine. But when I speak of physical activity, this is beyond work. Okay, so people with Parkinson's should do at least half an hour of physical activity every day. And also remain mentally active. So if your work in, entails a lot of mental activity, that's fine. But if not, then you should actually sit down and do a crossword or a Sudoku puzzle or something like that just to make your brain tick.